What up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Jet Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me as always is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, we did a show quite some time ago, months ago, when there were just rumors, and perhaps they were already confirmed, but nonetheless, we had our thoughts on these shows, and we had not seen anything yet. Now that we've seen it, because recently Marvel has released a, a, a trailer of their upcoming shows that they're going to be releasing in 2025. And I had to say, Brian, the thoughts we had back, way back when, has not changed for me based on what we've seen. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Supergirl casting and uh, some story updates, Superman, uh, uh, some Superman toys, and a trailer update. I don't know what the trailer update is, Brian, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reacting to what it is that you have to say regarding that. We'll get into some of the, uh, some of the Agatha wrap-up of uh, the show. I watched it last night with my wife. From day one, we've said it wasn't for us, and it, and it wasn't. We've watched it because, you know, this is, we, we try to understand where are they going with this. Uh, we'll talk about um, the Skeleton Crew trailer, Brian. That, you, you, there, there may have been a bit of tingle inside me, right? Of, 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 of excitement, of, 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 of positivity uh, based on what, I, what we saw there. Blade. It doesn't matter. You know how much paper has gone to waste on the Blade script? Game of Thrones, Brian. The Game of Thrones movies, I believe, is a very interesting experiment. We'll get into it a little bit more. The live action Gundam movie, Brian, I don't know. For me, I don't know if there's enough of a fan base for this to be uh, a success. But let's talk, we'll talk about that. Marvel TV trailer, Brian. They uh, released this trailer how many days ago? You want you want to? It was uh, right before the Agatha finale drop. Is when it came out. It was 2025, right? So this was footage of things they expect to release on Disney Plus in 2025. I would say generally, I agree with you. Like the things that directionally we were more excited about or more curious about when we did our rundown of everything that was on the calendar. I thought the trailer generally. Um, either underlined or increased that. I think if it was something we were concerned about or indifferent towards, I don't think the trailer did anything to change my mind about that. So a quick rundown, I think, look, the lead the lead of the trailer was Daredevil. I don't think you have to sell Daredevil to us, especially now that the key characters and the key crew from the Netflix show are back. We, you know, I think they've haired this show down uh, to nine episodes from 18. Uh, kind of sounds like you might get two nine episode seasons. Um, and the, the trailer's job is really not to give anything away. Uh, I thought the most interesting thing, that, and this was a recut of a trailer they had shown at D23, but the most interesting thing to me is the conversation in the diner between Matt and Wilson Fisk, where Fisk makes clear he understands his alter ego is there to, like that's the best yeah, line yeah. of the trailer. He's like, why does your darker half feel about this? Yeah. Um, so... I think that dynamic is what's going to come carry the show and our excitement is maximum for that. So the trailer is not going to, you know, deter that. Um, I would say I'm generally pumped for Marvel animation, you know, coming off of X-Men 97 and the improvements that what if made from season one to season two. So we get, you know, what if season three, we get yeah. Marvel zombies, we get friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, which I think is coming a little sooner than I thought it was going to be. And then, uh, Eyes of Wakanda. I would say, look, of those four, um, I'm actually probably most interested in Eyes of Wakanda. And there was the brief shots they had. You could kind of see that the animation does look a little different, which is something that was pitched to us, that like Ryan Coogler was using a little different approach with different artists than we saw um, in some of the prior shows. So that probably is the one I just am most curious about. Uh, and then I think what if season three, I would say I want to see if they take a, another leap um, from season two to season three. And then, you know, Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, we'll see. That's a TBD for me. And then Marvel Zombies, I'm just not, it's just not, Zombies is not really my thing. Um, yeah, I'm sure I mean, it'll be fine, but I'm just not, it's a small series. I think it's like four episodes. Um, not really my thing. 
So the yeah. other live action ones, I'm just not, I'm just not there. And like Ironheart to me, I'm not convinced. And the little bits we saw, I it's just like a bitch. Damn. I, I just feel like people are going to be holding the Iron Man shadow over this show too much. And I feel like the trailer just kind of played into that. And Wonder Man is no, <laughs> like maybe that show is not what they're pitching it to be in the trailer, but this like almost comedic. Um, I'm, I'm going to give it a chance. I, if it if it comes off She Hulkish, then I'm out. Yeah. So the tone of like it's a movie within a movie superhero deal yeah. is, I mean, okay. Which is fine. Right, so, I want to see what I want. I'm curious. I'm curious right. about this. The, so that's that. The style caught me off guard, like the the yeah. kind of the snappy dialogue, the way Yaya's sort of uh, demeanor is in, in the trailer was sort of very different than I expected. But um, I wouldn't say that I'm you know over the moon over the moon for it. So that was my rundown. What about you? Like what kind of stood out? Like what kind of got you curious? What sort of turned you off? Is this the last season of What If? They haven't said. But there is this notion that there is a final season. Yes. I'm disappointed in that because you and I discussed what if a long, long time ago and we said what if can be done forever. As long as the success of Marvel is 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 high, right? It was there or they've been doing stuff. What if is an opportunity to what if they fix this kind of? Hey. What if it turned out this? And they've turned it into this connected thing, which is whack to me. That's one of the things that turned me off because I believe what if should have been a what if story. That's why I loved the Doctor Strange one because you could have just left that at the at the end of that. It could have been that's it. That was a story, mm -hmm. and that would have been fine. But no, you want to continue and connect stuff now. Now we get a final season of what if? Are you kidding me? So what happens to MCU 2.0? That's what I'm hashtagging. I agree with you. Um, but maybe just from a resource. I mean, they have a lot of animation going on. Maybe from a resource allocation perspective, they're doing they're doing a Netflix on it where like Netflix never lets things go past four seasons and they just want to rotate around. But I'm with you because I kind of, kind of feel like season one was a, a warm up. Um, kind of had some moments where it was sort of uneven. I thought season two was a step forward. Like anytime a show has momentum like that, it, it feels like to cut it off is like creatively just kind of tough. But um, I don't know. Should be should have a run like the Sim the Simpsons, yo. <laughs> it could if you, if you did it right. It could, yeah. So if you did it right and if you thought about it, this is what if what if you what this is you could do this anytime you want. What if? I don't I already, I already have what if season four if they want to do it. I already have the, I already have the perfect storyline for what if season four. Do you want to share it now? And somebody taking this? <laughs> I'll say it. I'll, I'll hand this one out for free because they'll never do it. But everyone would have a good time except for maybe like three people. Um, yeah. No, what if season four should be an entire season about the Mahershala Ali blade? Wow. What if we got. Chad Stahelski. What if the vote of mayor raid with vampires happened? What if Aaron Pierre was the villain instead of Green Lantern? What if they just brought Wesley Snipes back? They, you could get eight episodes out of that disaster I, easily. The fact that they're choosing to end this sort of is just disappointing, and I guess lazy on the on that on that end to not look at the future of what this series could be because it can do a lot in terms of the imagination of what if <laughs> you know yeah. but uh yeah let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of that uh, of what if uh, another thing eyes of wakanda i did see the animation and i'm interested in, in some of the aspects of this show the fact that we'll see history and other established Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. Iron Fist was a name thrown in there, Brian, as well. Yep. I'm interested in seeing all that. It'll be sort of the foundation or the, the, the makeup or the derivative of what these future characters 
it won't it won't feel new but it will feel like a, a, a continued storyline and what we expect a Black Panther to be and do and, and it'll establish history so I think I'm interested because of that your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man is a what if this is a what if too big what you know what I'm saying I would have been more interested in the continuation listen you made X-Men 97 work why not continue what you would do? I'm tired of seeing a, a teenage Spider-Man kid. I'm I'm done. I want to move on. Well, then you have you can go watch Spider-Man Noir with Nick Cage on Amazon <laughs> when it comes out. <laughs> That's gonna be interesting. You saw him in the suit the other day. I was like, okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, this what? Well, Born Again again. I want to put um, what's that? The 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 dude from the the Heat. This cut this you don't gotta sell this to me. <laughs> this kind of stuff sells itself. Yeah. There are still questions. I mean, you know, I think they did they they obviously did the mea culpa and brought everyone back or most everyone back. But I think there's still questions on the writing side and the storytelling side, right? Like Netflix, we were in we knew we were in good hands, right? So we we think we're in good hands because of there's a lot of the same people. But if Disney's in the room Disneyfying stuff, then we still have risk. There you go. And it's quite possible these dudes are not just letting people just do it. And we can blame that. All. We can blame, if you want to, any quality, any quality degradation to that. Possibly. If those things start to come up. Because no way... Those Disney execs, those MCU execs are going to, I don't feel, allow others to cook. Because if that, if what they do is dope, that's a problem. Maybe. But that's what, you know, people are thinking. People are very, you know what I'm saying, Ryan? Because why not then put these guys, if, if they do, Brian, if they do what we expect or we hope Born Again does similar to what they did in the Netflix series and they do something similar to what's happening now with the Penguin and what Green Lanterns is trying to do, that puts everybody on notice that these guys over here know what they're doing. <laughs> And we got to see how much more we can put on their plate. Like that trucker. Look, I mean, we see on the movie side, right? Marvel is trying to run it back in some ways. I mean, they're trying to create Winter Soldier vibes with Captain America 4. Right? They're, you see them trying to channel and echo the feelings of the run-up to Endgame, which I get why they're doing it commercially, but I don't know if creatively that's going to work. And so we kind of have a little variation on that theme here right we have a show that generally is universally regarded as having been great at netflix and disney tried to really pivot from that and it crashed and burned spectacularly so they brought everyone back or most everyone back and now they're kind of saying make us a season four of what we had before but make it a little different and like the risk is you know even if it is the same people they can't recapture that magic or create something that feels at least new and propulsive enough from where they were. And we come on here and we're like, this kind of feels like a cheaper imitation of Netflix, you know, of the Netflix show, right? That's the risk that we're, that's what we're talking about. Like the action's okay, but it's not at that level. You know, the writing is okay, but it doesn't have the moments that that show had. Like there is that risk, even if it is somewhat of the same people. Um, but it doesn't deter my excitement. It just I'm just pointing out the parallels. Yeah. And I and Hart, Brian, I'm tired of the the exhilarating scream. I've seen it too much already. And I don't know what sort of uh conflict will evolve from this, but will we care? I don't know. I don't I don't know. But no one seems high on this show from the people that I've talked to. Isn't this show 
in some ways really about that crusade Kevin is on that we don't like. Which is? Young Avengers. Isn't that really what this is about? Because we'll get to it when we talk about Agatha. But everywhere we go, especially yeah, on yeah, TV, yeah, yeah. we yeah, keep yeah, coming yeah. back to that. And I scenes, know that yeah. technically there's a lot, there's some iterations of Young Avengers where it's Iron Lad and not Iron Heart. But come on. I, I mean, my guess is they're setting up this character to be the leader of the Young Avengers or one of the leaders of the Young Avengers, right? Like, that doesn't make me any more excited about it, but I'm just pointing out, like, the through lines that I think I see about what this show is supposed to do and what the character is supposed to do. As you watch this trailer and you think about, you know, your excitement level for it, I want you to imagine the competing trailer, a competing trailer that's centered on someday penguin season two, if it happens, lanterns season one, the paradise lost teasing wonder woman, and yeah, James Gunn could have his creature commandos a couple, couple cuts in there too. But imagine that trailer for two minutes alongside this one and think about the variety there and what really excites you and what you, what you really want to see. Think about that. I just want to see the resurgence of DC, man. Because that era of what happened with Justice League and Superman, for me... As a DC fan, because regardless, again, I'm going to say this again, regardless about what anybody thinks, this is a competition. Yeah. And they looked pitiful. So I'm looking at James Gunn's turn at recapturing that magic. And let's see what happens. Yeah, let us know in the conversation below what you guys think of that. Uh, Supergirl, Brian. More casting. Some story updates. I know you hate toys, Brian, because they usually reveal things that we don't want to see just yet. And some news on the trailer update. I forget her name, but she's a, she was in uh, a three-body problem. Mm -hmm. which, I don't know if you ever got to finish that. Did you get to finish that? Movie? Oh, I watched it. Yeah, I watched it. I'll, yeah, yeah, and I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll watch the follow-up. It's uneven, but Oh, it's yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too, me too, me too. Yeah. She is a character that has been casted to pull Supergirl into this revenge journey in this story. I'm not familiar with the character. I'm not familiar with the storyline, Ryan, but I know this is a popular storyline uh, for Supergirl, and uh, what have you read and heard about this? So we have our principal characters at this point. So obviously Millie, Millie Alcock from um, House of the Dragon has been previously set as Kara zor and Supergirl. Now we have Eve Ridley, who you mentioned was a three-body problem. She is Ruthie Knoll. Um, that is sort of the, as you say, the, the, the sidekick, but also sort of the, the trigger and the catalyst for bringing Supergirl into this story. Uh, and then we have our villain, uh, Matthias Schonertz, playing Krem of the Yellow Hills, uh, who, spoiler alert from the comics, will be the one responsible for killing either Ruthie's father or her family. Um, and that will kind of set off this revenge mission sort of across, across planets. What's interesting to me is none of these three people are megastars, which kind of suggests to me the budget on this is going to be tight like that they are aware of the problem we've discussed and they're going to almost try to i don't want to call it an indie movie but craig Gillespie, you know, godzilla minus one it. yeah that they're going to kind of try to keep this lean and mean and make sure it gives it has a chance to make money and they're going to rely on the story which obviously is a tom king story and he's in the room shepherding this as well um, that it gets people interested in the character and interested in this take on the character as opposed to saying, hey, we're going to spend $250 million for all these cosmic effects and now if the movie makes $250 million at the box office, we're screwed. Um, so that's, but as I've said, I mean, the storyline to me has potential, right? I mean, there's the, there's the partnership between the two women. You've got this idea of 
supergirls out there of young, not fully formed, celebrating her birthday, and then gets pulled into a story where she's kind of um, angered and sent, the, you know, sent on this sort of mission of, re- of revenge, a very unsuperman or unsupergirl type of role for her. So I'm interested. I mean, it sounds like it could be good. Uh, again, if you structure it right, if you budget it right, I'll definitely be. And if Superman, of course, as we talk about, is very successful, I think that will basically make sure that this does okay. Um, but it is interesting. Like everyone involved in this is, you know, kind of like very up and coming or not super well known. Like not only any of those three names would be like household, household names at this point. So it, that's a real bet. That's a real bet by the studio that the story and the character and the idea that they've put together, which James Gunn has said, they won great, won green lighted until they already had all that together. They think that alone really can sell and that these people can, you know, kind of go along for the ride and become more household names because of it. I don't know. Where's your, where's your excitement level on, on the, this idea of a Supergirl story? If you, again, you look back at our, at our Super um, Girls uh, video that we did quite some time ago, and it was referring a lot to the super, uh, female-led superhero and just female-led movies, um, blockbusters that generally have a history of not doing well because of, of the things that we discussed. And one of those things was believability. With this, there is that is non existent. You don't you don't have to believe she can do it. She can do it because she's Kryptonian and she has the power level to do it. How they yeah. do this story, not now the story. Like salt, all these other these are regular um even though they're skilled, yet still because they're not known, they didn't do well. I think this is different because of what it's attached to. And that believability aspect, you don't really think about because she's Kryptonian. She should be able to handle herself pretty well. And Brian, they have the DC fans who are familiar with this. If you get something popular and try to do it on film that's and do live action and it has its fan base, you already know pretty much what you can build from that. So I'm looking at this as going as being successful and I'm excited to see what they can do with this because the first iteration of it was forgettable. (laughs) So, and if you look at Sasha Kaye's, um, um, portrayal in in the Flash movie, you can say that was dope, and I'm pretty sure they can build from that and make something better. Yeah, and in fairness to Sasha Kaye, she was interviewed recently and kind of expressed a lot of regret about you know not having the opportunity to continue the role, it be- basically because the Flash did poorly. But she was saying like you know I was signed to a multi multi picture contract, which is standard and. It went nowhere because the film didn't do what it was supposed to. Um, but she was kind of defending her work, and I kind of was like, I don't think you need to defend your work. In the nah, movie. she doesn't. I think most people, I think most people liked what you brought to the character. So there are elements of this movie that I see elsewhere in existence already in pop culture that I think can make sense. So, for example, the notion of sort of planet hopping with a singular mission of either revenge or retribution. You know, we. We saw that done very in a very entertaining fashion in The Mandalorian. Right? Think about it. Mando and Grogu going after Moff Gideon. That basically is what we're talking about here. And that, now granted, that was a TV show and this is a movie. But that linear notion of, hey, hop from planet to planet. The planets are different settings. You get into different sorts of trouble. You know, in this case, maybe Supergirl has got to use her powers. Maybe she loses her powers. Like all these different variants you can come up with. And the characters evolve along the way before you get to your main objective, which is this bad guy at the end. We know that that can work. We know that that can move. We know that can be fun. So I am curious to see that. I also know, like I said, in the comics, there's a point at which Supergirl becomes pretty jaded. And I think there's a reference to that in the story that that the villain, who's a 
whose skills are primarily some, he's some kind of super powered like swordsman and archer that he apparently injures Crypto the dog. Uh, hey. And I'm wondering if that winds up being one of the catalysts for like Supergirl kind of flipping the switch a little bit and be like, okay, I'm not messing around anymore with, with this. And so I'm just kind of curious to see her character go from the classic archetype of Kara to more of like a almost warmongering, you know, angry, uh, vengeful type of Kara. I think that's one of the more interesting sort of you know, subplots to this. So at any rate, I mean, I think there are elements here that that definitely can can work and don't have to be um, super duper huge scale. Like I'd even say Agatha wasn't for me, but I liked the structure of the show. I liked the idea of like house or room or little vignette each week yeah, yeah, focused yeah, yeah, on yeah. different parts of the character. I actually thought it was well designed. And I think there's a little bit of that that can work in this movie as well. So I'm still high on it. I'm still high on it. And we know it's shooting uh, in London, I think, next month. So Yeah, it's, it looks like it's uh, getting ready to start, unlike other projects. <laughs> uh, so let us know in the comments section below what you guys think of uh, the latest news on Supergirl. Superman toys, Brian, and the tra and a trailer update. What do you got? Shouts to whoever asked James Gunn this on socials because it wasn't me, but it clearly was someone who was channeling my frustration. There was a list, um, not a, not images, but a like a just a text list of action figures forthcoming from the Superman film that leaked online this week. Okay. So, and the one piece of news or confirmation was there apparently in that line of toys there's a reference to a superman ultraman fight or showdown which the set photos also kind of gave away if you remember there's that guy with the u on his chest yes so james gunn when he was asked about that at the time had said kind of flippantly quote the primary protagonist of superman is shockingly superman the main villain of superman is shockingly lex luther kind of to say like yeah sure i'm letting you see superman ultraman fight on set in broad daylight in atlanta but it's not really that big of a deal to the story yeah. so i don't care that was sort yeah. of his. so his response to the toys which i thought was interesting quote i'm not sure what you're talking about meaning the leaked toy list he wouldn't confirm it but I have to okay all of the toys, and I don't think any of them spoil anything, end quote. Okay. So we'll see, but he's saying that any toy that goes to market doesn't give away his story, which I'm not aware. Is that standard? If you're the director, you actually approve all the merchandise personally before it goes out? I don't think that's the case. If he's saying that, Brian, they gave him the keys. He has the keys. That's the J.K. Rowling treatment. She has full control. George Lucas and J.K. Rowling have that, where like you can't make a single thing in Star Wars and Harry Potter unless they say it's okay. But that's unusual for like a single movie, right? Like this yeah. is that's a whole universe. So anyway, I thought it was interesting. He said that it gave me a little bit of hope, but we'll see. I'm sure I'll still be mad when the toys come out <laughs> like six months before the movie. Um, trailer stuff. You asked about it, so. He did confirm. See, now he's he's warming people up because he basically got on socials and said it's not totally finished yet, but he was working on it this weekend. Like he's not he's clearly telling you that because he's telling you it's coming soon. Now people have speculated that so we've got the Marvel Brazil event is next week. The DC Brazil event is a couple weeks after that. I think some okay. people are wondering is that maybe like what right around Thanksgiving. It? Because that may be the floor or first week of December. Is that the forum maybe where you, you see it pop up? But look, he's now talking about it every week. So clearly, you know, yeah. it's close. Yeah. 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 So within a month's time. Yep. Yeah. Let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of uh, the latest on the Superman uh, trailer update because. As Dominicans will say, ya está bueno. That's it. Let's, let's go. Let's talk about some of the stuff that's going on on TV with the superhero genre. Yeah. All right, let's, let's, let's first get into uh, Penguin, episode six. And I have a question for you, Brian. 
that I want you to sort of think about because I was thinking about it as I discussed the Penguin show with my my brother and a comment my sister made regarding Batman. But episode six, Brian, I had already seen it before. We talked about it um, on our last show. I had mentioned a few things, but let's talk about it now. What did you think? Oh, I thought the episode was was great. I probably, I like maybe the action of five a little bit more, but I feel like the ending of six, I was like, no, you can't do that. (laughs) (laughs) You can't fade to black there. That's brutal. Um, Yeah, that's why it's phenomenal. Go ahead. Yeah, no, but I thought I thought it was I thought there were moments in this show that were some of my favorites. I actually I thought his and then there's some storytelling stuff that I think is super interesting to talk about in a Batman context. Yes. So his speech to the other gangs, I think that's it. <laughs> the reason why I like that is because you have to make it believable how painful that gets word again. Crew, right? Yes. You have to make it believable. How does this guy get a crew? worthy of fighting who he's trying to fight to survive and the speech does a really good job of bringing together these competing interests and saying we actually do have some commonality and we do have something to lose and we have something to gain and therefore we can create this uneasy alliance to go up against the Maronis and the Gigantes and that I think was a very cool subversion of comic book and superhero and heroism type shows because that's a speech the hero gives right that's the speech the hero gives to all the good guys to rally them to save the day and here's this Captain America in them (laughs) right right exactly right like in Endgame where Paul Rudd's like he's pretty good at that right this is this is that except it's the Penguin and it's all these guys who you know you want Batman to ultimately lock up and you're kind of in that moment. You're like, yeah, go get him. You know? (laughs) So (laughs) so that's why this show is great because it manages to do that and manages to make you feel something when that's happening. What did you think about Vic's performance and that situation that he had to ultimately deal with when we first saw it in the previous episode, when squid noticed him and noticed what that something was happening. Right. I knew we were building up to that, but his performance after that, Brian was sold it to me because I was expecting a reaction. How are they going to do this? Because we know it's coming. How is he going to react to it? And I think how he was, how he was directed or he portrayed or, or expressed somewhat of his remorse. But knowing that this was, he knew that this he had to do this. Your thoughts on on that performance? Well, the character. And- and Brian, this is why I asked last time about Vic being possibly in the in the on the list for an Emmy. Well, I would say the character of Vic is incredibly well conceived as far as these sort of junior sidekicks go. Um, and like I said, I do think he's sort of the audience avatar into the world as well. But this is a great part. It's dynamic, it's conflicted. It's you, you definitely are with Vic emotionally in his ups and downs. Um, you, there's definitely a part of you that wanted him to get on the train a couple of episodes ago and run with his girl. And then there's a part of you that when he comes charging back into the penguins world is like, yeah, that's my guy, you know? So I think this episode really takes that to some logical extensions where he deals with, you know, he effectively deals with a childhood bully, right? That's effectively what that is. It's a resolution of something dating back to his childhood. This person clearly is someone he's been afraid of in some capacity for a long time. And he finds a way to stand up to that person, but does so in a, yeah. Like, I don't want to say it was shocking, but I would say like you could, it was, it was jarring for him. It was traumatizing for him to do that, even though he knew he had to. I mean, the portrayal is great. And then the next minute, you, you know, next couple minutes later, you see him dancing with the mother and being incredibly human, you know, and incredibly empathetic. It's like the character is really well rated. It actually, it, I'm going to ask a question to you in the context of this world. And I don't think it will happen, to be clear. It's not comic books canon. 
and it, we, I guess we have questions as to whether Vic will survive the next episode. I think he will. Yeah. I, I, I'd be, I'd be surprised if both of them do, but we'll see. Anyway, if they made Renzi Feliz Robin, would you hate it? That is something that has been going around for the past few weeks. It's never bothered me because of how these characters are being reimagined. This is this Matt Reeves world and and uh, and his character is very compelling and these are one of these occasions, Brian, where you you don't mind. That's what I would say. I, I, I wouldn't mind that if he did uh, and wind up being Robin in this world. I did have the same reaction and I'll be interested to see how the rest of this season plays out. I would say the only character hole I see in the arc is usually there's a commonality between Bruce and Dick in particular about how their parents were killed. And in this case, his family was killed indirectly by a super villain, right? The flood kills his family. It wasn't a murder. Now, this particular show leaves open the possibility, like what if Oz's mom, what if some of the people he's come to view as his adopted family are killed? Then maybe you have that commonality. But character beats wise, he does fit the profile, right? A troubled youth. He clearly has a moral compass. He clearly yeah. has some skills, but he's very unrefined and very much in search of direction and, and mentorship, which is why he's under the penguin's wing and kind of can't, you know, let go of the positives of that. Yeah. We also, I also bring it up because there's been this ongoing rumor that Robin is in Batman Part Two, and I've been trying to make that work in a way that doesn't detract from the overall story arc of Bruce um, and potentially Court of Owls. And when I've been seeing this, I'm like, is this maybe a solution where you're getting the backstory of this character done for you in this show? To where if you were to bring Renzi Feliz in as a Robin, even if he's not called Robin, he's the Robin-ish character, you don't have to spend a lot of the movie on what we're seeing now. Is that a yeah. way that Matt Reeves could get that to work without the movie being three and a half hours this time? Yeah. Was anybody mad when this dude went from not being Robin to Batman right away in, in The Dark Knight Returns? Uh, oh, Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, Rob, yeah, Robin, Dark Rises. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, he's gonna be Batman. Yeah, right. He's gonna be Batman. The dude was a beat cop. You know, no martial arts, no nothing. <laughs> no, he he's gonna be Batman. I right, bet it's over. We don't well, got to see the continuation. Can, well, of this. I was like, then he can cross over with Falcon, and they can have a commiseration movie. <laughs> yeah. so. The only thing is, does Batman let what he did to Squid? You know, he, he, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if he's, I don't know how he's redeemed, but I don't know how that works. But it, Batman, perhaps even yeah. knowing that perhaps that he did that. I think in the Reeves verse though, that actually makes more sense. So remember we were talking about yeah. in the animated series, like the, where, where there's that whole Robin, Robin's reckoning, right? Yeah. He basically is going on a, he's going to kill this guy. He's on a revenge yeah, quest yeah, to yeah. kill this guy, right? And it becomes the Zuko. Yeah, Tony Zuko, who, yes. who, by the way, I mean, absolutely belongs in this show at some point. If you know, maybe he's maybe he's the season-ending tease. I don't know. That character has to be around somewhere. But anyway, this idea of Squib isn't that far off that idea of like Robin having these homicidal thoughts or revenge-driven thoughts. Yeah. And in the Reeves verse, it would make more sense if he had actually done it than if he had held back. Because yeah. Reeves verse is more about flawed characters, right? So you you yeah. You, the character in some ways becomes more sympathetic because that's the the measures he went to to deal with that at that age and that development. And then Batman's trying to mold that into something a little more on the right side of the line. But as yeah. we saw, the patents in Batman already kind of crosses the line anyway, right? So you kind of like he's not as 
Squeaky, yeah. He's not as squeaky clean as some of our prior Batman have been. So that's why I think it kind of fits a little bit better. Um, and you could There's argue a lot he's of Robin there, without yes. being Robin, right? Like in yes. Batman Part 2, if he shows up in a costume side by side to fight, that's pretty suspect. But if we know he's filling the Robin role, but he's not yet doing full on Robin things until Batman Part 3, maybe that's a way to do it. You know, maybe he, maybe, maybe that's a way to get him in there. And Part 2 is more about taking the things we saw him do in the penguin on the wrong side of the law and just starting to bring him back the other way. And then maybe in part three, he has more of a heroes, an actual hero's turn. We'll see. I'm, I, this is pure speculation, but yeah. I, could, I could see it with this individual yeah, yeah. and this character with this arc. I could see Reeves maybe doing something with it. Let's see. Let's see. I want your take on this. You know that my thing with the penguin has been that little, I guess, asterisk mm -hmm. or blemishes. And I'm not saying Batman in the show. I, I don't want to see Batman. I want to no. know that his presence is there and people are talking yeah. about him. Come on, the dude in the bat being up thugs and stuff. Nobody's talking. Nobody's talking about him. Not even in Arkham. He's been around for what? Two years still, right? Two years. Yeah, two plus years at this point. Oh, well, I have a question about that, but yeah, go ahead. Two plus years at least. And so he's, what is he doing though? Is he taking, is he not around? And that is all I've asked about. I'm not, I'm not wanting to see Batman in the mix here. But I want to know that his presence is around. People are talking about it. Just because they mentioned him in the beginning, yeah, that's fine. They mentioned him, but stuff is happening that I know, or Batman or Batman fans would feel like Batman wouldn't let j these things just slide and these these things happen. Nothing. Having said that, I spoke to two individuals, perhaps who are not Batman fans like I am and some others, but I thought of the notion, Brian, and I want to ask you this. Does the inclusion moving forward, perhaps in a season two or whatever, if they do something next with the inclusion or the participation of his character in this show ruin the experience? Or oh, uh, not ruin it, but some, somewhat take away from it. I think if, yeah, I think if he's in it a lot, yes. You, you, you don't want to muddy the line too much between the TV world and the, and the film world. It, it is an art. We've talked about that you can do it, but there does have to be transition. Like yes. when we're talking about with the lanterns, for example, there's a build to that. But part of what we're saying with lanterns is lanterns as a TV show has an end game. I, I, I wouldn't really want to see a world where lanterns does, you know, two or three, two seasons, for example, on HBO. And then they go up on the big screen for a Justice League movie. And then we're back for Lantern season three as if Justice League didn't happen. Like yeah. it kind of has to be like Lanterns has to be at or reaching the end of its run. And then those guys go graduate mm -hmm. into the movie. So for Penguin and Batman to coexist, I think Reeves has given himself an opportunity to have, mm -hmm. have his cake and eat it too, as long as he finds the right mix of Batman's presence across mm -hmm. the two. So I think right now you and I would agree he's gone a little far the other way. Like he's removed him almost, he's like 99% removed him. And I would probably say you should 90% remove him. Yeah, yeah. But if he's in there half the time, the show is just no, a, a weaker imitation of him, of his movies. And, and Absolutely. Absolutely. My biggest thing, and, and this goes to the thing about time and, and about scale. So we see at the end of episode five, they discover the underground railway layer. In episode six, he's got an actual operation. How much time passed has between passed. episode five and six? Because up until now, everything has been sort of flashback to present day. I have mm. felt like we have only been living a few days yeah. in the present. Yeah. But there's no way that in like 24 hours, yes. he got all of that infrastructure put together down there. Yeah. So that's my Batman question. If it's just a few days and all these characters are in motion right after the flood, I can see where Batman would not be focused on that yet. 
because there's bigger yeah. citywide problems. Mm-hmm. But a criminal organization with guys riding bikes, distributing drugs all throughout the city on a large scale, he would notice that. Yeah. And so the operation feels a little big now to not be at least on his radar. And that was my question of like, if it's weeks that have passed and this has been happening, now you're pushing that believability of like, at what point will it just somehow have to be in front of him? And by the way, if it wasn't in front of him before, I would have thought the three dead bodies hanging with their <laughs> limbs chopped off might've gotten his attention too. It's I'm getting saying. awfully public. It's getting awfully public, I think, for there to be no Batman presence at all. Exactly. Or, and that's Gordon, all I'm or somebody that you know would then exactly. trace it back to Batman. Yeah. We saw we did see the guy make an appearance, uh the guy with the voice. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? That dude. Yeah. So I like I, I like that 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 inclusion. But yeah, man, that that's the thing that bothers me. That thing that bothers me just a little bit. Just a little bit. Because I'm like it's like you it's like when you're out in the streets, when you expect the cops to be around <laughs> when something is going down. And where, where are all the cops? Where's Batman when all of this that's transpired? He don't know nothing. He's not, a, I don't know, but. Well, especially because uh, he, know, also because don't forget, he knows us. We know exactly. that. Exactly. Like, we told, know that. My, Those I told two my have brother. Exactly. I told my brother, Oz knows Batman. They've had conversations. And that wasn't a bad run in. Those were good, interesting. Yeah. Um, interactions between them and the penguin is not about batman it's certainly about the rise of oz but that world that he's in what i'm saying is his presence someone talking some some whispers whatever you know what i'm saying some guy saying i ain't going out there there's this dude whatever but they're not doing any of it. And that's fine if you don't want to do that. But it's it, it makes it kind of weird that there's no presence, not even of Commissioner Gordon, you know? Really? Well, he's not commissioner yet, right? Ah, uh, yeah. So, well, well he, yes. He's not commissioner that, yet, but, but not even Gordon around. Normal. Detective Gordon would be more likely to be on some of the scenes of this. Wouldn't it have been dope if he would have been the one at the at the Falcones talking to? Yeah, for right. sure. I mean, the other thing they could have done, you know, we mentioned use of the bat signal um, during the crimes. I think would have been helpful. I think the other thing is it's tough because I know the Pattinson version isn't as fully developed, but he does have some tech, and so some Batman tech could have been used instead of Batman to let you know that he was aware of something. Like you just have a quick cut some, in somewhere in this scene to be like, he is watching. He hasn't just made imagine. his yet. Yes, just imagine after Vic did what he did with Squid, that there's a shot when you when you look at Vic and the sky, you can see the bat signal. And he looks up and then he just runs out of it. That's yeah. it. That's what you got to do. Yeah. That's what you got to do. But whatever. Now, I will say on the plus side, they are doing some really cool things, I think, for Batman Part 2, which is, and I texted this to you, and it's funny because Cape Crusader started pulling on this thread in Season 1 as well, which was the, the origin of Batman in the comics is effectively a gang war in Gotham. Rival gangs going head-to-head, it kind of brings him into the public eye for the first time. That effectively is being done here. Now, we think it may lead to Court of Owls, it'll be, it'll be manipulated. But this idea of Moroni's gigantes and now the Penguin family, if you will, that is very true to the heart of original Batman. And this idea that Batman Part 2 will be a city where there is, you know, I think in Batman Part 1, there was this idea of there was a lot of crime, there was a lot of despair, but it didn't feel as organized throughout the city. Mm-hmm. Now there's this idea of like, it's pretty organized. Like there's definitely factions. It's There's definitely like people have coalesced into these power teams. And that's what Batman has to contend with. I think that's very cool. Like that part of yeah. it, I really do hope we get to see the his reaction yes. to how to navigate that, especially given we know exactly. his own family is dirty 
and yes. going to be pulled into this too. I'm telling you, Matt Reeves has done a fantastic job of reimagining this world of Batman. And I'm certainly interested in seeing where it goes in the next iteration of the of the film. But his inclusion in this show should have some, not necessarily impact, but some aura in, in it. And some people are going to argue that this setup will lead you to the Joker. I'm arguing, I'm still arguing the opposite. Really? But this, well, no, because if you think about like Dark Knight, right? Like Heath Ledger's whole contention is like Batman basically ruins the operations of existing organized crime families. And so then they turn to the Joker as a way to sort of combat that. But I think the way this world is set up, I think it lends itself to other villains if they wanted to do that um, other than the Joker. That would be my, or just rely, I mean, for Batman part two, I don't think they even need anything like that. They can just rely on family heads, but we know somebody's coming, right? We've heard about Hush. We've heard about other. Yeah. So that's why I think like the idea of a villain at the head or someone who comes in to try to help the families as they're struggling against Batman. I mean, I get it. I just hope it's not the Joker that they use. So the finale came. Uh, it sets up a few things and it sets up, Brian, what you discussed earlier. Uh, the Young Avengers, Oof, which yeah. we've been saying since it was even hinted at. Unless you do it, the Young Avengers, the animated show, the, uh, the animated movie, that was dope. I like that. It was a one and done. We don't need to continue. Right? I was cool, but this notion of reaching to a special event of the Young Avengers to me is quite ridiculous. But anyway, Agatha, what did you think, Brian, of how this all wrapped up and what it leads to? I have a mixed reaction to it, and I think my rating will reflect that and my review will reflect that. I think the show, if I look, think about what were my expectations going in, I think this, I, I, I got to give the show credit in a couple of areas. Like I said, I think it was better designed than I expected. Like I said, I liked the Witch's Road structure. Uh, I liked how they encased each episode, gave each character some shine while keeping Catherine Hahn sort of at the MC um, center of it. Um, I liked the fact that it didn't try to be something it was not. It did not kind of go full into like a superpowered effects driven witches battle because I think that would have been absolutely terrible had they really leaned on that week after week. So I like the fact that they kept it pretty grounded and, and kept it within the confines of what it could be. Catherine Hunt is great. I mean, I knew that going in. I think she's excellent and I have no problems with, you know, what she did. I thought the spring characters were pretty good. Look, my biggest complaint is simple. It's the, I mean, we get spoiler. The spoiler alert that this show really was a vehicle to get to Wiccan. I, I, I'm just not with it. Like, I mean, it's just, you know, it, you've got some good actors in this lineup, right? I mean, like Haley Steinfeld, um, um, Iman Bellani, you got the guy cameo, uh, in Falcon and Winter Soldier, you know, you got kid Loki cameo, like you've had like, and now Ironheart, Riri Williams, like, like I get, I get it, but like I, it did feel when I got to the end. Part of what I liked about this show was that it would felt very unmarvel all the way through, and then to get to the end and find out it was all about Marvel, 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 which is we just need to get to where he needs to be to be a part of Young Avengers. I don't know. I felt kind of empty when that's what it was about. So. That's sort of my like mixed reaction to how this played out. My premise going into the show was I wasn't convinced the show needed to exist and I'm still not. And that's saying that it was well designed, well acted with some good parts to it. My point is if the whole point of the show was just to create Billy Maximoff, then I don't know why the show had to exist because you could have done that some other way in five minutes rather than nine episodes. Yeah. Like you said earlier, Brian, I would, when I was watching it, uh, I tried to focus like when I when I watch the penguin, I'm nothing else exists, right? And when I'm watching Agatha, I'm doing laundry and ironing and stuff like that. Reminds me of that commercial. Damn it, I missed it again. Going back, you know. <laughs> uh yeah, I don't have too much to say about the uh, Agatha other than some of the same positive remarks you had uh previously. Uh it was well done. It was well done, but it just wasn't for me. 
and that's okay. Let's move on. Can I ask you one? Actually, let me ask you sure. one quick question before we move on. Mm-hmm. So, turns out Aubrey Plaza was playing Death. Are we clear that's the Death? Like the one that figured into Thanos, his love story? And I was trying to figure out, like, is that, are they, are they modifying that? Or like, because it's I would assume death. so. She's only referred to as Lady Death, but I think she's referred to sometimes in the comics. But Death is actually a manifested yeah. character who is Thanos' yes. love interest on a yes. global cosmic scale. Yes. Is this supposed to be that character? I, could, I believe I so. I really clear on that. Oh, okay. I, I believe so. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, everything that I've seen watching Emergency Awesome, New Rock Stars, shout outs to them for their work on, on finding out what's going on and who's who. But there wasn't any instance at least I don't recall of them not saying that this is not her. That this okay. is not Lady Death. So, I mean, Aubrey Plaza is a name actress. So then it made me wonder, like, does that mean that she's coming back? Because we know Thanos is coming back for Secret Wars. Is, she, is that relationship somehow going to be explored at some future date? Because we don't know which Thanos they're bringing back. Are they bringing back the original Thanos? No, no, we do not. We 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 know he's coming back. We just don't know what iteration or what form or where we are in the timeline. So because if, um, if he's bringing, uh, even though so, he's not technically dead, the, the, what I saw, but this doesn't totally answer your question. What I saw was he's only in Secret Wars, and he's in the crea- he's reportedly in the creation of Battle World, and he would take the place of the Beyonder in the story arc. I've had it with this dump. But that doesn't answer which version of him it is. It just says the character of Thanos would be Josh Brolin would be doing that. <laughs> this I don't know. There's just too much going on there. We don't know. This is like I mean, Robert Downey Jr.'s doom. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. I don't know. Are we at the are we, are we at the are we at the Lloyd Christmas point with this or not? Like are we there or not? I don't think we're quite no, at the maximum point. No, right? no, 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 no. I'm definitively no, no. saying it's a, it's a lost cause. But are we at we the... We got it. <laughs> are we at the Lloyd Christmas part <laughs> yet with, with Secret Wars? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. We really quickly talk about another Blade new script, Brian. Uh, exactly. Exactly. It's like, why? You know, like I said, I gave you What If Season 4 as a, a all about the Marshall Ali blade. So then when I saw that story that they were, you know, remember, and remember, this is why I'm telling people, <laughs> just Google all the stories when the Eric Pearson draft was being written, the last draft. Mm-hmm. Google the number of times stories refer to, oh, people are finally happy with it. Everyone's finally on board. They finally yeah. cracked it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's happened. why this is like Everyone said chicken that. little. This is, this is chicken really- little right here. This is why we told you all along, <laughs> don't believe it. Like, if you think you're being gaslit about the presidential election, the media, there's <laughs> nothing compared to how you're being gaslit about Blake. It's not even close. Don't believe a word that comes out of Mouse again about this project <laughs> until you see it in the theater, until you, you hand, your ticket is scanned and you can actually see the movie. Yeah. I mean, my tongue-in-cheek response to this is I hope the new script is an epitaph. There's no scenario right now for any announcement coming out of Marvel regarding Blade involving Ali, involving this property that can get me excited. What do you think Ali is thinking, Ryan? I think ego is a big part of it. He doesn't want to take the L on it. It was his idea. But it's like, I get it. I get it. Yeah. So we got, just to review, we... We went from, we're shooting November 1st, which would be after we're taped, before we're taped, you and I are taping this, to we have no director, we now have no writer, and all we have is what we've had all along, which is Mahershala Ali attached to the lead role. There's rumors Mia Goth is still attached to this project contractually, but I kind of view that similar to how Aaron Pierre was attached as the villain in prior iterations. She is, but she isn't necessarily going to be the villain. 
this is probably a little bit of Ali propaganda, but there is some smoke around. He is no longer willing to do the movie if the script basically doesn't feature him enough, which to which I say, well, duh. And we asked this question all along, right? They seem to really want to focus on Blade's daughter. They seem to want to do all these things that don't really revolve around Blade. And I can't blame him for saying, like, I didn't sign up to do a Blade and Friends movie. I signed up to do a Blade movie. And I'm the star here. Right? So he's he's in his early 50s now. So even if they were to magically find a director and a writer and get this thing filmed sometime next year, the earliest it goes up on screen is 2026, so probably later in the year. That's an optimistic timeline. October. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at that point, you're saying if he's going to do this character in multiple iterations and in Midnight Suns, he's going to be starting to do that when he's 53, 55, 56 years old. I would just point out Wesley Snipes right now is 62. Right now. Oh. So if the age gap is, you know, is what it is, it's like 12 years. Like, but if, I don't know, like it's just, there's a point in which it's like, okay, my choice is a 56-year-old Marsha Ali or a 66-year-old, 67-year-old Wesley Snipes. I mean, is that big of a difference? It's like, I, see what I'm saying? Like, it's just at some point, it kind of just says, like, if you're going to do this, you might as well just restart and try to find a Blade who's 30 or 35. Because otherwise, if it's just two older guys, people are just going to say, bring back Snipes and have him do it. Yeah, and then do the handoff that you want him to... I mean, it's like, it's going to be a disaster regardless if you want... I mean, you'll get that first... <clears throat> A uh, good wave of people just want to go see Wesley Snipes as Blade. You're not going to like at this rate right now. Mahershala Ali's Blade is going to be not. It's not going to do well at the box office. I'm sorry, it's going to be a failure. No, I don't. I think the odds of that are incredibly low. Incredibly low. It being a big hit. No. Well, it 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 is a much more likely outcome that this is the crow than it is yeah. a success. Because The Crow, another long gestating gothic superhero project that ultimately was made this past summer and just came and went and, and made no money at all. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Skeleton Crew trailer, Brian. What did you think, man? I'm high on this show. I'm excited. I think it's just... At I first, think I wasn't. Okay. I mean, I don't think I'm the primary target audience. I think my daughter is. Yes. But I think it feels very Star Wars to me. I think John Watts, obviously, has got some pedigree coming off of Spider-Man movies. Um, and so I, I kind of have some trust in the people making it that, like, they know how to do younger characters. Um, and it feels fun. Like, it doesn't feel... Yeah. Like, and it feels unconstrained by the Skywalkers, right? So it just kind of feels like I'm, I'm, you know, a little... Not quite the same feeling as Mandalorian because that's a little more adult, but, like, that idea of like we're kind yeah. of free and doing something a little different in the Star Wars universe and I'm curious to see where it goes. So I, I actually am pretty high on the show and I think it, I think the trailer looks pretty good. Um, and we'll see what Jude Law is doing but the character seems sort of interesting. So no, I'm, I'm intrigued. Like I don't know if it's like a Goonies meets Star Wars type of idea but you know, yeah, I, think I'm definitely, that, I think that could, be, it could work. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing it with my kids. It's definitely not just with like me because it's totally. not, like you said, I'm not the target audience but I'll enjoy it, watching it with them, uh, if they enjoy it. Um, and I, somewhat obviously, I would have to find it enjoyable. And it looks interesting. It looks really good. That's what yeah, I'm that's saying. What I'm it saying, looks right? really Usually, good. Usually, the space shots and the planetary shots look yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get into this Game of Thrones movie, Brian. This, to me is with what the MCU has done and across of what the DCU is doing. Mm -hmm. There you got it. And Game of Thrones has not just the fan base, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> they have the world. They are a global IP franchise and everybody knows. Uh -huh. And if you can do what you've done in the in the on TV and somehow elevate it on screen and for sure have people 
on day one and that weekend. This is what it's all about right here. This is this is uh I guess the plan and the th I guess the the last piece of the puzzle for those looking to really innovate in terms of how they release content and how they want to maximize and really squeeze the juice out of an IP. Sure. Your thoughts on this uh this development on Game of Thrones movie and this has this been something they've talked about for some time? So it's very early, uh, to be clear. This is Warner Brothers wants to do this. There's no writer, there's no director, there's no like this is an idea. But I think the mm -hmm. idea is coming out of this ongoing discussion we're having about IP and what is the right medium and how do you try to create a synergy between TV and 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 film, which no one has really, really done yet. We think Matt Reeves may be on the path to being the first and the closest to do it, but no one's really ac accomplished this perfectly yet. So I had brought up on a prior show before because, you know, the last season of Game of Thrones was so polarizing. And I think people felt it was rushed and people felt generally were kind of unhappy with some of the choices that were made. I wonder in hindsight, when I see this news, if Warner Brothers wishes they had converted the last season into a trilogy of films, as opposed to the handful of overlong episodes that they did. That's something I that they have they, been thinking about, correct? That's what I'm saying. I think they, yeah. they're they studying the reaction to that and the viewerships and the scale of these stories and saying, is it the right thing to just leave it on TV? Is there something we should have done with the, the old show on the big screen at some point? And can we do something going forward? I would argue, like I said, I would argue yes. I would argue if you had made season seven a trilogy of films, which would have been the same amount of time as you spent watching your television, but you would spread it out into this more eventized sequence, I certainly think they would have made a lot of money. And um, then the exposition on TV. And it might have been a better product, depending on who was directing. They'd, and the thing is, I think Warner Brothers also say, look, we're spending movie dollars to make these shows anyway. So maybe mm -hmm. they ought to be made with the idea that they're going to the movies. And yeah. the dragons, large-scale battles. Game of Thrones has elements that belong on a big screen, quite honestly. Yeah. Harry Potter were going the other way. And I think it's a very noble experiment, right? They made a very successful set of eight movies. Now they're doing 10 seasons of TV to flesh out more of the books um, that they couldn't cover. I think that's actually a very smart and sensible way to keep the IP alive, but keep it new enough that people are going to re-engage with it. I've always argued Lord of the Rings missed this. I've always told to anyone who would listen, The Hobbit is the quintessential television show to me. The sequ the structure of that book is absolutely set up to be a multi-season TV show. Instead of making Rings of Power, they should have remade The Hobbit chapter by chapter. To me, that would have been guaranteed success. Not that Rings of Power is hideous, but like I think the story would have been much tighter because it was Tolkien's work. We're seeing with Lanterns. We know Lanterns is an experiment in launching a major character on television with the idea that he will eventually be a movie star. We know that that's happened, even if they haven't announced it. So I think that's what Warner Brothers... Look, Warner Brothers needs hits. We know that. They've had some success, right? They've had Dune. They've got some things working for them right now, but they need money. They need cash, right? They need return. So they're searching for what they have in the library and like, how do we get the most out of that? So I'm all for this experiment. I don't know what story they want to tell, but I'm all for the experiment to see if it works. Yeah. Uh, let us know in the comments section below what you guys think. What you guys think of this uh, possible Game of Thrones movie and this uh, new way to introduce IP. I don't know what the right way is, but I think if you tell a story where it ends up that the movie will resolve it, who is not gonna go? Yeah. If well, you've done here, a fantastic job with this. And here's the thing with Game of Thrones, right? So as we know, they ended the show before George R.R. R. Martin ended the books. So if he ever does get around to writing and publishing the last Game of Thrones book, that's your movie. I mean, that's your trilogy. And you call it the, you basically retcon the last season of the TV show and you say, well, this is the, this is the one he always meant to write. That's what we're going to make it do. Now, that's down the road. But I'm saying that's what you make. Yeah. Make that into three movies and see what happens. Also, by they're trying to do a live action Gundam movie. 
getting a little crowded, I feel like, in this area of the world. Is this just me? Yeah, I mean, this is FOMO from the Voltron. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Even like the Pacific Rim, Godzilla, like these these kaiju giant something, robots, creatures, movies. Feels like we're getting a lot of these now. Well, I mean, King Kong, Godzilla, they, they may move. They make money, right? They make money. They make money. So... I don't know how I don't know how Gundam does though. I don't think it's one I, I don't think it's one of those success stories right there. Certainly it has its fan base, but is it enough to get the casual in there to put you over the top? I don't think so. I don't think so. So there's an interesting subplot to this though, which I'm cur- which it's not for me necessarily, but I get what they're doing. So we talked about Netflix animation last time. Tomb Raider, Terminator Zero. We did not talk about Netflix Gundam. They did a Netflix Gundam anime series last year, which people did yes. not like. That was not that was not well reviewed, not well received. This movie was set up as a Netflix movie and actually was going to be directed by the yes. same guy who directed Skull Island. That was the original okay. iteration. The news that okay. came this week was they scrapped that. They have a new director and they left Netflix because the animated show was bad. So whoever controls the Gundam IP basically pulled it away from Netflix and said, we want to do a theatrical release with another house. That I thought was at least somewhat like intriguing as a subplot to this. Um, and they're, they technically, I think they did one of these a long time ago, right? There was there was a Gundam yes. movie back in the day, like not a high yes. budget one or a, a Wiley movie, but there was one that kind of was yes. mid, right? People don't really like that in retrospect. That's why I say so, I don't know if this is a good. I get it. That if you own the IP, you're gonna try to get it yeah. off the ground and try to make some money off of it. But it's a hard one. It's a hard. And it's one. legendary. Legendary Studios is who's behind the Godzilla Kong movies. They are behind this. They're the they're the, okay. they're the production house behind this too. So that is the commonality there. And and please God, no crossover. Um, but. <laughs> But, but when I see this, immediately I'm like, are you guys trying to set up a Gundams versus Godzilla versus Monsterverse movie at some point? But um, I don't know. I, the thing that also concerns me, I just hope that Voltron gets done and up on screen before this happens. Because I don't yeah. want anything to cannibalize how, how awesome and how spectacle Voltron could be. <laughs> yeah, man. I'll, this is Beat Street. You remember that that movie Beat Street? No, I've not seen that. Okay, Beat Street is a uh, is one of the. It was a indie film. I think they got funded. Harry Belafonte was behind it, and it was the first like movie, like hip hop movie, right? It was the first one, and this was supposed to get a theatrical release and everything. People heard how good this movie was. Hollywood fast tracked their own version which turned out to be breaking oh. with turbo and ozone yeah, in them. Yeah, yeah. so beast street came out beast street was made first and it was done really it's, it's a great it's a classic movie it'll be on turner classic films it's, that's how good it is in terms <laughs> of what hip-hop how it was birthed and they got they caught wind of it and they pushed out electric boogaloo. Gun, Gundam feels like they're they're trying to do something off of. So certainly, Voltron hasn't been done, but they see the possibility with Voltron, uh-huh. and they're gonna try to get a little bit of that too. But if it, it is if it's too close, Brian, to the release of Voltron and to what's happening with Voltron, it'll get muddled. And it'll probably lose his steam because people, the casuals, won't know what's what. And that's the hope that I, I, that's what I don't, I hope it doesn't happen. Agreed. The show goes on!